Thanks for coming. I'm uh, very happy to see you guys. Uh, last last week's crop walk was extremely cold. Uh, we had people chattering and shivering. Uh, this week uh, looks a lot better. It's a little bit wet, but I think we're able to get out to, to see everything that we wanted to see. So, first of all, I'd like to thank um, all of our sponsors for the crop walk. You'll see our our wall of fame back there, and uh, the donuts and coffee were provided by MNP. So thanks to them. I'm not sure if anybody from MNP is here, but. All right, forget it. Just eat the donuts. <laughs> we, uh, I'd like to thank Jeremy Hummel for coming out. He's going to talk about the cutworm scenario going on right now. Hector and his grad students are going to go over pea leaf weevil and flea beetles. Thanks to Dennis Godet, we're going to go through some of the cereal leaf diseases. And uh, we'll stop, talk briefly about this ultimate canola challenge trial that we have. That's a trial that has all different types of different alternative products that are applied and and uh, then we're going to finish off with another one of these alternative products that we happen to be on a our third year of a research uh, contract research trial and the the research director happened to be coming down for a visit so I thought I'd give him an opportunity to talk about uh, the trials there so in uh, typical Ross McKenzie fashion we're, we're going to talk quickly about the weather how many of you guys think it's been cold this year yeah. And Ross plays this trick on us every year, doesn't he? And then he pulls up the information. In, in almost every location that we've looked at, we're actually at or above normal since May 1st. So you can believe it or not, but uh, I'd actually like uh, the, the website, the ACIS website, that's A-C-I-S. Anyone can look like a genius on this website. It's a, it's a, they've really been putting a lot of effort into making it more user-friendly. And uh, we're actually working with Ralph Wright's team as well to try to develop um, an even more user-friendly platform for farmers. I think there's so many tools that are just not used as far as uh, that website's concerned. So yeah, I've got all of the sheets here. Claris Home uh, <coughs> put this one out just for Josh because he always says it's not hot out in Claris Home. But, uh, it's never hot out in Claris Home. You're, you're actually right at normal for, for precipitation. So and uh, for the heat units, you're quite above normal. Actually, you're more above normal than any other location that we check. So keep your mouth shut, please. <laughs> <laughs> Just kidding, Josh. So Lethbridge precipitation almost bang on for normal from May 1st. Uh, on the heat unit sides, we're above normal by looks to be about almost 100 heat units. Of course, we've only accumulated 400 and. 75 heat units at this point in time, and when you look at the crops, we, we certainly could use some more. Yeah. Certainly, I think we've had cooler than normal nighttime temperatures, and that's yeah. what I think uh, people remember, those, those cold mornings. So Tabor is uh, slightly below normal on precipitation, and slightly above normal on the, the corn heat units. Vauxhall is below normal on precipitation <coughs> by looks like about 15 millimeters and above normal on the corn heat units. Bow Island is below normal on the precipitation and just slightly above on the heat units. And Medicine Hat just slightly below normal on the precipitation and almost exactly normal on corn heat units. <clears throat> One thing before we get headed out, and, and this is part of the club root mitigation program, and uh, uh, I apologize if you, you don't find that the booties are stylish enough for you. Uh, if, if you're one of these people that, uh, that really care about what people think about you, we actually have a washing station over here. So before and after we leave the field, if you wouldn't mind either throwing on a pair of booties or heading over to this little washing station here, there's a brush, scrape your boots off, and then you get to dip <coughs> your feet in a sterilization platform, I guess you might call it. Hi everybody, um, I'm Amanda. Um, I'm a master's student researching the pea leaf weevil, um, which is a pest of peas back here. You can see some damage if you guys walk up later. Um, the pea leaf weevil is an invasive pest. It was first found um, near Lethbridge here in 1997 and it's spreading throughout the prairies, so it's spreading mostly eastwards and northwards. 
Um, so my project is to uh, optimize a semiochemical trapping system for the P-leaf weevil. Um, so basically what I want to do is use its host plant volatiles and pheromones to trap it. Um, and the main goal of that project is to just help monitor its spread throughout the prairies. And eventually we want to be able to use it as a predictive tool. So right now the best um, way to deal with P-leaf weevil is to use um, insecticide treated seed. But as you guys obviously know, you have to know that before you plant your seed in the ground. Um, so if we could get some predictive numbers in our fall trap capture, we're hoping that we'd be able to see, oh, there's a really bad P-leaf weevil problem here. You guys should use pesticide treated seeds in this area and maybe in another area that's really not um, so useful. Um, so that's what I'm trying to do. Um, I guess some basic background about the P-leaf weevil. Um, there's quite a bit of feeding damage on the peas over here. You guys can walk around and see it later. It looks kind of like little cookie cutter bite marks in the leaves and that's caused by the adults. They feed on those leaves early in the spring and then they'll lay one batch of eggs or so many batches of eggs but have one, uh, one breeding season I guess throughout the year. Um, and then those larvae, they'll hatch and they'll feed underground. And they're the really damaging part. Um, they feed on the rhizobium containing root nodules in the pea plants. Um, and they really destroy that rhizobium there and they, um, they inhibit the ability of that plant to fix nitrogen. Um, so the larvae really damage that current pea crop and they also can um, decrease the fertilizer, or sorry, the nitrogen yields in the soil for the future years. Um, yeah, so we've, uh, we have a couple of samples of pea leaf weevil here that we can pass around to show you guys. Um, and there's some pea leaves in there that have feeding damage on there too, so you can see what that looks like. Um, and does anybody have any questions? Where did the pea leaf weevil come in from in 37? Um, I think that they move around a bit on uh, cut foliage and stuff like that too. Um, some of them are be moving around on um, like flowers of the east coast of North America. Originally they're from Europe and North Africa, um, but they probably came in on some kind of pea crop somewhere. Um, and they're, they're also a pest of faba beans, so you might hear them there. So is uh, most uh, pea growers, would they use uh, treated seed? No. Um, yeah. Right now, it's the kind of boundary for that is Highway 1. So pretty much the, we see that the farmers that are south of Highway 1 are using treated seed and north of Highway 1, not so much. Um, both places we're hoping to be able to do that. Um, right now the monitoring is just going down and measuring that feeding damage so we have uh, agronomists out right now that are surveying all those notches on the pea plants and they make a, a map that we send out weekly with the prairie pest monitoring network. Or sorry, that's on, that gets sent out once a year. Uh, well, it's definitely spreading. spreading yeah. yeah. Martha, do you want to comment on the effect of seeding date on the uh, damage? Um, I really think that seeding date has a big effect on the damage and the risk there. Um, I think that if you are one of the farmers who's seeding early, you might be the unlucky ones who attract those weevils out of their overwintering sites. Um, and the people who happen to seed later might be less affected. So um, this year we kind of had a couple weeks of good seeding where some people seeded and then some crappy wet cold weather where there was a break and then a few more people seeded after that and I really think that the people who seeded after that cold weather will have less damage. So what if you're a grower who hasn't used a seed treatment or maybe somebody asked this when I was looking at the thing but uh, there are options for control, uh, insecticide options after the crop is up, depending on like what's the economic threshold? There are some sprays that you can use. I think Hector can tell you a bit more about that. He's more familiar with that than I am. Okay. Uh, the question of uh, economic threshold and how to manage the wheel is actually a, uh, quite a challenge. Uh, for one thing, we have been able to validate the economic threshold that was uh, used in the US. Somebody came up with a nominal threshold of 30% of seedlings with damage on the clam leaf as the uh, kind of the, that magic number that uh, you want to monitor and the crop stage of course whenever you talk about economic thresholds you need the damage level or density of insects or abundance and the crop stages and for pe for peas and fava beans 
Uh, actually, I should say, especially for peas, we don't know exactly what it is for fava beans, but for peas, we say that if your peas are past the sixth node stage or even the fifth node stage, uh, don't worry about the pea leaf weevil. Uh, we actually have data from a greenhouse experiment that we did a few years ago where we added eggs of the pea leaf weevil at the second node stage and at the fifth node stage. And only when you uh, added the eggs at the second node stage, you actually had a lot of damage on the, uh, on the uh, nodules. Uh, once the peas are past the fifth node stage, uh, the larva, the eggs take a long time to hatch. Then the, uh, a lot of the larva don't find their way to the root nodules and the plants are already at a stage where they're no longer vulnerable to the damage. So that's an important thing to remember. So if you planted your peas early and you're finding that you're just getting uh, new damage uh, and, the, and the peas are already at the six or seven node stage, you can just ignore the weevils. Um, now, if you, um, if you have enough damage, more than three out of 10 seedlings with damage on the clam leaf, and the reason we use the clam leaf is because that's the best indication of uh, recent activity of the weevil. If you, if you see damage on the lower no, uh, nodes and lower uh, foliage, uh, it's possible that the weevils already died or they have been eaten by, by uh, predators or they're no longer active. Uh, so the clam leaf is the best indication. If you have more than 30%, then we say, yes, you have reached the economic threshold. And then uh, what are you going to do? Uh, it's, uh, you, you can spray and you probably will, will kill uh, a lot of the, uh, the weevils, but the problem is that they lay a lot of eggs, and more than likely they, uh, they already have laid uh, enough eggs. Um, here, is a, here is a bit of a trivia question that I always like to ask, and I'm sure you all know the answer. How many eggs can a female weevil lay? <laughs> I'm sure you've heard this before. A thousand, yeah, that's a pretty good guess. In, in fact, somebody in, in Scandinavia, I can't remember, do you remember the paper? I think it was in Sweden or Finland, they actually counted how many eggs can they lay, and I don't know who would have such patience. Uh, 3,000 <laughs> eggs. <laughs> so, so the, but the, uh, when, I, when I tell this story, people ask me, well, if they lay so many eggs, how come the world is not run over by weevils? You know, with so many eggs, other insects don't lay as many eggs. Uh, we study with them softly in the lab, they lay uh, 50 eggs. Uh, Ligus bugs, they lay on average 300 eggs. So why do weevils lay so many eggs? <laughs> uh, I guess they lay so many eggs because a lot of those eggs uh, don't actually result in larvae that make it into uh, larvae that actually damage nodules. So it's not, it's not easy being a pea leaf weevil larva. You should feel sorry for them. <laughs> Imagine if the, if the ground gets very hard and the soil is not the proper sandy, loamy texture, they have a hard time finding their way into the, the roots. And, uh, and, and most of the time, this is competition from between the larva that actually causes the, the populations to decline. But I'm getting sidetracked. I forgot what I was going to say. I think I was going to talk about the, uh, the, what you do if you have uh, the economic thresholds. And uh, most of the papers, actually, I think all of the papers that uh, our former graduate student read on this topic, uh, Megan Van Koski did a master's degree and she did a very nice uh, literature review. She surveyed all of the <clears throat> papers written on pea leaf weevil and uh, fuller insecticides, and uh, not one of them actually reported that the spraying of a uh, foliar insecticide resulted in a yield increase. Now, there's several reasons for that. I have no question that the insecticides do kill the, the weevils. They, I'm sure they do. I think the problem is that they lay so many eggs that they may already have laid enough eggs, or you can also get more weevils coming into the field. And uh, this is something I've observed in the past, that you may, we actually collected lots of weevils in a field that was already sprayed, and I think it's just mi migration of new weevils coming in. And I think the data that Amanda is collecting from the pheromone traps shows that, right, that you, you, don't, you don't see just one migration, you see waves of migrations right into yeah, the definitely. pheromone traps. So that's why spraying insecticides with a foliar is uh, it's a, it's a bit of a tricky, tricky gamble. Uh, we recommend that people, if they think they're going to have problems with the pea leaf weevil, then uh, uh, consider using a seed treatment. Um, the other alternative is, uh, which actually is a more expensive one, and probably nobody would do this, is uh, to add nitrogen to the soil. Or if you can, if you have access to manure, you can actually use manure and provide nitrogen. Because if you can provide enough nitrogen in the soil, then forget about the pea leaf weevil. Uh, the, this insect doesn't have a, a direct um, effect in, in terms of killing the plants or destroying the plants. They're really 
more of a, uh, a bit of a parasite in some ways because they're attacking the the beneficial bacteria that fix nitrogen into the root nodules. So they're not they're not really going to affect the plant. Even the damage that you see on the on the uh, foliage, it looks really bad. But as far as actually impacting the plant, it's, uh, it's almost inconsequential. You, maybe 10% of the foliage is taken, but the plants don't really require that, that much foliage. So that's the, the messy, nebulous message about the field leaf evil management. Other questions? So you said they migrate. Uh, so are your populations higher at the edges of the field, or where should people be scouting when they're looking for them? Let's get Amanda to answer this question. Um, I think that they usually are at the edge of the sorry. I think that they usually are um, at the edge of the field, but I also do find that they're really clumped. So there'll be times when we're like sampling along the edge, and you'll find nothing and nothing, nothing, and then later on, there's a whole group of them. So I would recommend if you're going to survey them, definitely do like a big like transect or something like that and survey along the line. So after you're saying. Uh it's not so much a yield issue, it's more the fertilized end fixing is would be a big issue. Yeah, that's correct. Uh, uh, I'm going to talk about the data that um, Megan Van Koski collected, a master's student, a few years ago. We did a study with cages where we manipulated the nitrogen level, so we added uh, 60 or 80 pounds of nitrogen to the soil, and then we had a control with it, just the normal, whatever was in the soil. And in the cages that had nitrogen added, uh, the weevils actually could only reduce something like 3% of the yield. Uh, in, in the other cages, we could, we could see a little bit of bigger reduction. Nothing was statistically significant, so if you, uh, if you ask a statistician, they'll say the weevil has no effect. Uh, from a farmer's perspective, perhaps that could be a concern because uh, we saw up to 17% the yield loss in those cages without nitrogen, but it was not consistent and it was quite variable. I actually would like to see more data from uh, farmers' combined yield monitors. If they could leave uh, strips where they have treated and untreated seed and compare the yields and have replicated strips, of course, you need uh, at least two, preferably four big strips. And now with your combined yield monitors, you can actually measure that and see whether there's any effect. Uh, hi, Josh. Good to see you here. <laughs> um, good question. I am afraid I cannot answer the your question. Uh, what is the, the the last insecticide you mentioned? I know uh, Stubascot Mears is not here because... Okay. Um, I, I could tell you that the among the um, neonicotinoids, like uh, thymethoxam, which is Cruiser, and uh, Midacropril, Gaucho, I wouldn't expect to see a big difference. Th those are in the same class, so the the um, neonics are unlikely to have a big difference. And the other one, I don't know what is the active ingredient. Is, is, is it a completely different class? Yeah, that that might be. I'm not familiar with it. I suspect that uh, I know that there was. Is that that Dupont? What? No, that's a cruiser or a stretch shield. It's just measured. Like they're both Bayer. Bayer. Okay. I know that there was um, a, a big push to develop new chemistries because the the neonics were not as effective with some beetles. For example, uh, I can tell you about wire worms. It's a really good, interesting story where it provides crop protection, so the the, the yield is protected, but the wire worms will just go to sleep and then they will wake up in in a, in a few weeks and continue feeding. So it doesn't affect the population. So we tried that for the pea leaf weevil, and a few of the weevils uh, actually appear to be dead, you know, they're sleeping and then they wake up, but uh, that's a small proportion. The majority that we see, they were actually killed, like 30% of the adults are killed by thymetoxin. Okay, any other question? Should we talk about flea beetles quickly while we're here, or are we moving on, Ken? Flea, should I talk about flea beetles here? There is a, kind of a similar question with the flea beetles and the pea leaf wheel. Okay, uh, any more questions for Amanda? Because she, I guess she's gonna go collect her uh, pheromone traps before it starts raining. <laughs> Last chance to get Amanda. <laughs> Thank you. If not, uh, thanks Amanda. <laughs> can I leave my weevils with you? Can I leave my weevils with you? Yeah, I can put them okay. back. Okay, I just want to take a couple more. Let's talk about flea beetles, and uh, I'm not doing a lot of work these days with flea beetles, but I, I, uh, I, I like to point out some similarities with the pea leaf weevil. 
In, in terms of the, uh, our ability to predict bee leaf and flea beetles, the same question applies because farmers need to make a decision before they see it whether they have enough flea beetles. And with flea beetles, I guess we, we realize that they are pretty much uh, rampant and abundant everywhere. But the question of seed and date is one that I, I can tell you uh, about a story that we did several years ago, and it's, uh, it's actually the opposite to the pea leaf weevil. Uh, and, in, and it varies with region, uh, whether you are in southern Alberta, central or northern Alberta, or if you were in Manitoba. But I guess we're not in Manitoba, so we're not, they have bigger things to worry about, like not, not being able to see it yet. Um, the flea beetles, we have uh, two species in Alberta that are, well, there are, we have more than two species, but the, the main two, two pest species are the striped flea beetle, which is dominant in northern central Alberta and it seems to be becoming more dominant even uh, for the south. In our region in southern Alberta we still have the crucifer flea beetle as the as the most dominant one and we see very few striped flea beetles. You may see um, like many years ago when we did these studies we would see one in a thousand would be the striped flea beetle. You may see now that that proportion is increasing and uh, as you move a little bit north you will see that the population is becoming more and more of the striped flea beetle and there is a uh, an interesting uh, study that has been done looking at the effect of, uh, of um, neonicotinoid insecticides on the flea beetles. And the striped flea beetle is not affected as much as the crucifer flea beetle. So it appears that the populations are shifting towards that species in, in, in those areas where that uh, flea beetle is common. But what I'd like to mention is that uh, flea beetles, in fact, uh, if you plant early, you can actually escape them in our region. So people who planted canola very early before the snow came, you are probably not going to have to worry about uh, flea beetles because uh, the uh, vulnerable stage for flea beetles is especially the cotyledon stage. Once the plant produces uh, true leaves, they are considered to be safe and escape flea beetles, unless, of course, you have a huge infestation and in the, the flea beetles are, are eating more than half of the foliage. But normally, if you are at the cotyledon stage, uh, what is the economic threshold for flea beetle damage? I'm sure you all know it. Thirty percent of the leaves, pretty close. It's, uh, it's said twenty-five percent is the is the number, and uh, and I think Syngenta has a very nice package with visual images where you can compare and test your ability to to uh, to uh, look at the uh, damage and assess it visually. But twenty-five percent is the is the magical number, and uh, I think ninety-nine percent of the seed probably is treated with some kind of insecticide against flea beetles. So more than likely you won't see an issue. But I think in in central Alberta and northern Alberta they are. They have had to spray because this striped flea beetle is still causing damage, and the, then they have to pay attention on the visual of 25%. But if you plant it late, uh, the crucifer flea beetle tends to come out a little bit later than the striped flea beetle. And if uh, you plant it in the middle of May, late May, then you might uh, need to pay attention to the flea beetles. We are we're doing a study uh, looking at the seasonal activity of ligus bugs and cavity seed pod weevils and uh, we are finding quite a few flea beetles in the flicks with and in some sites so probably important to keep an eye on them but the uh, especially those fields that were planted late and remember the economic threshold is 25 percent of uh, cotyledon damage i think that's all i was going to say about uh, flea beetles unless somebody has a question about them So the seed treatment isn't impacting the stripe? That's correct, yeah. There might be other factors because it seems to be widespread. Not, I think it's not just in, uh, in areas where they, uh, well, it's hard to say because I think almost all canola is uh, with seed treatment, so you can't really distinguish climate factors or other factors uh, and separate them from uh, insecticide effects. <laughs> I'm, I'm not. I'm not new. It's only Amanda was new. Hector's a little mad at me because I I picked Argentina to win. Yeah, he's got his Brazil shirt on. <laughs>